Christian nationalism. That's become a thing now, especially with Stephen Wolf's book about Christian nationalism. We have to seriously pay attention to this term and what it means. And so in this presentation, I'm going to look through three different ways that the term is used, and then we're going to give it a critique as to uh, whether it is even Christian at all. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are and whenever you are around the world. Uh, this is the On Pilgrimage Through the Scripture podcast. My name is Mike Queller. I'm your pilgrimage leader. And today, as we uh, previewed, we're going to be looking at varieties of Christian nationalism. We're going to look at that term, Christian nationalism, and what it means to certain people and uh, what, it, uh, what it does for certain people. And uh, so we'll be taking a look at that. But first, a word from our sponsor, come join the pilgrimage. Uh, check out our Gab, MeWe, and Facebook pages on Pilgrimage to the Scripture. That's where our notes and outlines are. If you go out there, uh, you can pick up our handouts for this particular presentation. You can find uh, other uh, presentations that we've done. This is where you can ask questions and comment, and uh, we will respond. You can also go to our Facebook channel, our YouTube channel, uh, on Pilgrimage Through the Scripture. You can like this video, subscribe, and you can get notification of uh, other videos that we produce uh, as part of our work here. But first, let's take a look at Christian nationalism. As we, as we said, Christian nationalism has risen to prominence in these days. That term, uh, in the very recent, uh, very recent past, people started claiming to be or denouncing Christian nationalism. Um, you know, and we've seen um, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert uh, use those terms for themselves. We've seen Jamar Tisby and other folks denounce Christian nationalism. But what does it really mean? to be a Christian nationalist. What does that mean? The term itself is obscure. And what I've found just wandering around is that there are actually three different ways in which the term is used. And so we're gonna look at each one of those versions and discuss whether in fact they are scriptural. So here's the three versions. One, I call it the received version. That When I was first converted in the 1970s, we didn't use the term Christian nationalism, but what, what we talked about <clears throat> was that America was founded as a Christian nation and it has a special relationship with God. So we, had, we have that definition, which is the oldest one. I call it the received version. Then Reconstructionist. Uh, we need to claim slash reclaim America for God. In other words, we're going to impose a Christian worldview and culture on America. Third one, <clears throat> again, is a, a rather old one, uh, but recently it's been called Christian nationalism. It's, I call it racial Christian nationals, nationalism. Christians are a particular people group which has a special relationship with God. Now, there's no one consensus as to what the term means, and different people may hold to 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 two or more of these views, they may cross claims, you know, cross uh, things that cross, they may pull from each different uh, idea to form their own version of Christian nationalism. But in general, you can think of it in, in these three ways. Okay, let's take a look at the received view. Now, this is the one, again, that I learned when, we, uh, when I was converted in the 1970s. And it goes like this. America was founded as an explicitly Christian nation and has a special relationship with God, such that Americans are his people. <clears throat> so where this comes from is, is uh, we look at the founders. You know, if you look at the Mayflower Compact and, and those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of things, if we, we see that 
the people that came here were, were saying things like, we're going for once to establish a country where God's law is, is enforced. And we're not going, you know, we're going to have the truth of God enforced here in this country. This, this uh, document, this uh, belief holds that the, may hold that the founding documents are divinely inspired and that the founders were committed Christians as we understand the term. And so therefore, America is, is a Christian nation is, and is God's special people. We came here to found this country for him. The founders were committed Christians and they organize this country in a way that uh, honors and glorifies him. Therefore, the passages that apply to national Israel apply to the USA. After all, if we're God's special people, then uh, verses like 2 Chronicles 7.14 apply here. We should impose Christian laws on the USA. This is a Christian nation and we should act like Christians. And uh, conversely, we must work to suppress any non-Christian influence in the country. People who are going to remove these, remove Christian laws or, or put in non-Christian laws or to legislate permission for sin, we need to undo all of that. This has historically been strongly associated with fundamentalist Christians, the in, independent fundamental Baptists of the world uh, have been associated with this. I like to think of it as the Bible and the cross wrapped in a flag. And uh, so that's the way they look at it. Now let's take a look. First of all, the USA is never mentioned in scripture and therefore it's not God's chosen people. God has, doesn't mention the United States of America and therefore we can't say that. The founders and con in, in contradiction to what this belief holds, the founders were not Christian as we understand it. Washington, Jefferson, and Adams were deists. In fact, Adams was antipathetic to the uh, doctrines of grace. He hated them. He wrote in a letter to Jefferson that you know he just hated it. And Jefferson, on his part, he cut up the Bible to include only the verses he approved of, largely the verses that Jesus spoke, and he, it's called Jefferson's Bible. You could get a I think you can get a copy of it. Washington himself, I mean, you know, while he made references to God and to uh, references to God, he was rarely in a church. I mean, we rarely, um, we rarely see him where he actually set foot in church. The founding documents that we have owe more to John Locke than they do to the Bible. Uh, if you look through, if you look through the founding documents like the, the Declaration of Independence and the, uh, the Constitution very rarely is God mentioned. The ideas here are more like are are more from John Locke's political theory than they are anything else. And I'm going to argue that using Chronicles, using passages like Second Chronicles 7:14 to apply to the USA is twisting Scripture. It's not true. In fact, let's look at it. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And people with this particular perspective say, okay, the Americans are my people. And if we, uh, and we are called by his name, we are Christian Americans. And if we humble ourselves and pray and seek our face when we have gone in the wrong way, then he'll turn, he'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Well, and this is, so it's a, a promise, it's interpreted as a promise from God to restore the nation to greatness if we repent of our sin. But that's not what it says. In 2 Chronicles 7, if we look at the context, Solomon has finished building the temple and there's amid uh, great ceremony and sacrifices and God powerfully appeared to signal his approval. And so this is the promise. So 2 Chronicles 7.14 is part of the promise that he gave to the nation of, of Israel for healing for the transgression of his people. So it has, it, it, in context, it is only about the nation of Israel. If the nation of Israel, who are his people and called by his name, 
when they sin, shall hear from, shall humble themselves, pray, and seek their face, and turn from their wicked ways. He will hear. Now, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, as we look at this, what it refers to when he says, my people, is not the, New, the Old Testament people of Israel, but he's talking about the New Test, his New Testament people, the citizens of his kingdom, i.e. Christians, the people who have, these are, the peop, these are his people and the people who are called by his name, Christians. As we look at scripture, universally all Christians are citizens of his kingdom and locally in a church. And so this promise is really to Christians gathered in a church. If a church goes wrong and everything goes sideways, then if the church will repent of their sin and turn to him, they'll be healed and God will restore his presence to that particular church. And that's what it means. It has nothing to do with the United States of America. So this particular view is fallacious on the idea that the USA is God's people, that this, that the people who founded it were explicitly Christian, that references to my people refer to the United States. So we have, um, so this is just way out from what scripture teaches. The second view, I call the reconstructionist view. And I think it's associated with Rush Dooney and North and those who follow them. Strongly associated with postmillennialism. Now, the idea of postmillennialism is that as we evangelize, the world will become increasingly evangelized. And at a certain point, Christ will return to finish establishing the kingdom. Now, they did not say, the postmillennials do not say it's a straight line like this going up. But they say, you know, it goes up and down, and up and down, and up and down. But in general, if we were to draw a trend line, the trend line would be upward over time. <laughs> and so in this particular view, you know, as we have more and more Christians, as we evangelize and we have more and more Christians in the United States, it's a Christian's duty to claim the nation for Christ. As, a, as the USA becomes more evangelized, we should enact Christian laws and in fact, the Old Testament Mosaic civil, civil Code, some people argue. Now, Stephen Wolf has written a, uh, what's becoming a very influential book uh, about Christian nationalism. And he is in this line of thinking. He is, in fact, a covenantal Presbyterian. And so he is in, in, this, line of, in this line of thinking here. And he says, Here's what a Christian nation is, he says. A self-conscious self -conscious Christian nation is a people group saying we are Christian and then acting in light of that. We are Christians and we are going to act for our good. Okay, so it's a people group, i.e. like Americans, that identify as Christians and seek to encourage others to be Christians. And so there is a, with this, a cultural Christianity. And so we want to create within the United States, we want to create a Christian culture. And so laws should be enacted to encourage people to become Christians. For example, and he makes a big deal about this, Sabbath laws. We should put Sabbath laws in to say, to tell, let people know because we shut our door, we shut our doors and don't do business on Sunday, that this is a Christian nation. He says, now we don't force people to attend church or become Christians but it's strongly encouraged that you do. Now he says, separate peoples will have separate traditions. And so a, a, a United States Christian nation will not look like a Ugandan Christian nation, which will not look like a Chinese Christian nation. So, or a Korean Christian nation. So it makes no claim. And so different peoples will have different ways of enacting this. And he makes no claim to the founders that I've heard, but takes the political situation as it is and seeks to subject it to what Christians believe. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a couple of clips from Stephen Wolf that will illuminate and provide more background on what he's calling Christian nationalism. 
Christian nationals refers to a, a, a self-conscious Christian nation, so a, a people group saying we are Christian, and then acting, out, acting um, in light of that, meaning we're Christian, so we're going to act for our good. So this is what nations do generally is they, they say, they basically organize politics and all that and they arrange themselves for their good. I'm saying as a Christian people, you're not just gonna seek the temporal things of life which are good, like you know, being able to exercise your vocation and the good of family life and all that. Um, you're also going to seek after uh, within the way you order yourselves as a people for Christian, like specifically Christian ends. So mm -hmm. this would include things like I think Sabbath laws which would, um, on, on Sundays, it would essentially, uh, we can talk about this more, but it essentially kind of close down businesses and uh, of an emergency and essential services. And that would be a way of not forcing people to attend church or do any sort of worship, but it would be kind of a, rem a reminder for the people that this is what this day is for. The term Christian nationalism has been thrown around a lot lately most of the time as a way to dismiss or mock anyone who wants to engage in politics as a Christian. But those of us who look to the broad Christian tradition should seize the term for ourselves. We are indeed Christian nationalists. The nation is not a mere collection of people, but a people united around a set of shared loves. Some of these loves are universal in all nations, such as the love of family and home. Other loves are more particular to each nation, such as shared culture, language, and national struggles and achievements. Together, these loves form a nation's way of life, generating a love for the place in which you and your ancestors conducted that way of life. Johann Herder once said that everyone loves his country, his manners, his language, his wife, his children, not because they are the best in the world, but because they are absolutely his own, and he loves himself and his own labors in them. Now, when we hear the term nationalism, many of us think of fascism or militarism, and there's a history of that in the world for sure. But it's better to think of the ism of nationalism as referring to the nation acting as a people for their national good. A Christian nation is a nation that is self-consciously Christian, and on that account seeks the nation's complete good, earthly and heavenly goods, for themselves and for their posterity. Now the two ways that a people order themselves is through civil law and social customs. Civil laws, when just, are ordinances of God binding our conscience. Why? because just laws are rooted in God's moral law. God's law is tailored for our good and happiness. Our highest happiness is found in eternal life. And so civil law ought to order us to the things of eternal life, word and sacrament. Civil law cannot compel belief in the gospel, nor that one worships God in heart, but it can create the best outward conditions for one to conduct undisturbed and focused worship of God. Thus, in addition to ensuring justice in our civil relations, Civil authority can regulate the Sabbath day, for example, to remove those daily cares and concerns that distract us from Sunday worship. Though often defined by its abuse, cultural Christianity is vital to Christian nationalism. While civil law is an explicit ordering of society, cultural Christianity operates implicitly by establishing in us a positive prejudicial regard for the gospel. It cannot bring us to faith but it makes the truths of the faith plausible to us. Cultural Christianity also contributes to a more orderly, high-trust society, since everyone has a mutual expectation of Christian conduct. Thus, we have an explicit ordering of civil law and an implicit ordering by social custom. Together, these compose the sort of thing Christian nationalism is, what I call a totality of national action. This is a fancy way of saying that all things that a Christian nation would expect of us, both in law and custom, and no matter how mundane, are for the good of the whole. I'm Stephen Wolf. For more on Christian nationalism, check out my book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. So now, it, having listened to Stephen Wolf, we, under, we can see that he is very much in the mode of the post-millennialist or the reconstructionist approach. The, the, I mean, Stephen Wolf will appeal to you if you're a post-millennialist. But <clears throat> if we look at scripture, Jesus said, and he, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Christians are not called to exercise political supremacy or fight politically for God's laws. It's not the way it's done. We build God's kingdom by winning people to Christ and establishing churches where God's rule is recognized. 
The third view is the racialist view. I call it the racialist view. Basically, the concept of a people group, which Wolf uses, is hardened to include people of a specific descent, language, and culture. This is where we get into, quote, white Christian nationalism and kinism. In this view, the USA is a country of Christians of European Protestant descent. No blacks, Asians, Jews, Catholics are part of the Christian American nation. And so what we're trying to do here is try to create a nation, an America, in which Christians of European Protestant descent are privileged. And in fact, they're the citizens and everybody else is not. You're permitted to be here, but unless you're one of these, you're not an American. Now, the Christianity we talk through here, talk about here, is not what uh, true believers would consider Christianity. Christianity here is nominal and cultural. And I think of some caricatures like in Charlie Daniels' song, Uneasy Rider, or Fanny Flagg's Fried Green Tomatoes. You know, in that society, we saw in Southern, now both of, Fanny Flagg's Fried Green Tomatoes is, is set in the South of the 30s. And we had two vying traditions in the, in the American South. One was the party all night, you know, uh, at, at the honky tonk, and the other was church on Sunday. And those were the two competing forces within um, Southern culture. But that was, that's, was considered, all of those were considered Christians because they were all there, it was nominal and Christian. Same thing with Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and John Barrett's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. All of those were pictures of Southern society and where Christianity was not the Christianity spoken of in the Bible, but it's a nominal and cultural construct that uses the term Christian. Also, when you look at D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, that depicts a racialist view of America. And what they're looking for is not Christianity of the Bible, but traditional culture as we currently do it. And so if you want to look for groups, the Ku Klux Klan, the white Aryans and their compounds are examples of organizations of this view. Now, I use just simply Southern examples because that's what I know. I'm, I'm, I've lived mostly in the American South, but there are varieties of this that can be found in, in the North, for the suburbs of Chicago, the South Boston. Perhaps you might find examples of this. <clears throat> This is, you know, this is not true Christianity. It's Christian in name only. It, it, it is, in fact, bigotry and hatred, not love. Christians are called to love, and this is called to hate. It exists to maintain a certain set of privileges. It exists to maintain a certain mode of living. They just call it, they might call it Christian nationalism now, but that's not what it is. See, Christ did not come to establish distinctions. He came to break down distinctions between people. In Ephesians 2, he says this, uh, Paul says this, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, <clears throat> that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ... Jesus, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And, he, and here's, the, here's the point. And he, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in this flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, putting to, thereby putting to death the enmity. So Christ did not come to per establish or perpetuate distinctions. Christ did not come to keep us separated into black and white. 
In fact, the fact that there's black church and white church is probably one of the most God dishonoring things that exist in American culture today. And it's perpetuated on both sides. The Anglos started it. They kicked the, they kicked the African Americans out of church. We don't want you guys in our church. And so they had to form their own church. But at the same time, the African Americans do not want, or I will, I'm going to say there are African Americans who do not want to be with Anglos in church. Vody Bauckham tells the story of when he was convicted to, uh, of this, Ephesians chapter two, to try to bring reconciliation between African-Americans and Anglo-Americans, uh, that he went to white church. And he was criticized by those in the African-American church. He was criticized. You're taking the best and brightest of us and taking it over to the enemy. Well, I don't know if the word enemy was used. I don't remember the quote exactly. But Vody's reaction was, well, thanks for calling me best and brightest, but <clears throat> isn't this what Christ came to do? Isn't this what Christ came to do, to abolish in his flesh the enmity, to make of the two one new man? that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. So this idea, this racialist idea is profoundly unchristian, profoundly anti-Christian. In, in my perspective, it is nothing more than it is a usurpation of the term Christian in order to perpetuate a set of privileges held by a group of people based on uh, race and ethnicity. So let me give a a uh, set of reflections on this as we wind this up. Christians are called, as we just saw, to seek to create unity in Christ, not division between peoples. Jesus came to bring all people together in one. The kingdom of God is manifested in the churches. And to the extent that we perpetuate the sinful separation between, in the case of the United States, between African-Americans and Anglo-Americans, that's blaspheming God, and it needs not to be done. The second point I want to make is that Scripture was, is written to a people who had no influence in governmental policy. Paul wrote, to, Paul wrote giving instruction to master slaves, parents, and children, but he didn't talk to magistrates and soldiers. He didn't do that. Essentially, it was an acknowledgement that governments are going to be non-Christian. They're going to be people by not us. And so what Paul said, here's what we do with the fact that we have this non-Christian slash anti-Christian government. The idea is obey the government in all areas where we can and where it's not violating the worship of God. And I have the quotes there. Or when government is outside its sphere, Matthew 22. So, and we do this, as Peter tells us, just to not get tied up or tied down or get in con conflicts about things that don't matter. We want to focus on building the kingdom. We want to focus on winning people to Christ and building churches where the rule of Christ is recognized. There was, there's no command in scripture to transform government or governmental policy. Now that said, the prophets did exercise the prophetic voice from outside the government, calling them, in, calling them to account. See, John the Baptist. John the Baptist spoke to Herod and said, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. And so it is, it is prophetic for us as our churches to say it is not right for the government to authorize this. It is not right for this to happen. So what should we do? What then should we do? We as, as first century Christians, unlike them, we have, we can participate in government. And so how should we relate to that? And so this is a matter of Christian liberty. Clearly, churches should not participate in government beyond the prophetic voice. We should not, pastors should not be getting in pulpits talking about immigration policy or talking about uh, things that don't 
uh, affect Christianity except for the prophetic voice to call out what the government is doing is wrong. It is for individuals to exercise in a call to exercise a calling to governmental service. Individual Christians may be called by God, just like they're called to anything else, and as such, to bring a Christian influence in those areas of government. Uh, you think of Wil uh, 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 Wilberforce, who spent his entire life in the English Parliament fighting to end the curse of slavery. So maybe somebody's called to do that, to go into politics and to take on some of the evils that are in the government and fix them and correct them. Christians in government should govern from a Christian standpoint, but should not seek to impose Christian ritual on non-Christians. Laws should be drawn from Christian principles. For example, the right to life. We should, we should, we should take Christian principles as the focus for our legislative proposals. But we should not <clears throat> enact religious observance on non-Christians. We don't force them to go to church. We don't force them to obey Sabbath laws. We don't do that. Um, the focus of laws that we pass should be on societal stability and order. Pass laws that are necessary what, for the, the common good, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13. We should be, if somebody's going to be in government, we should be beyond the requirements, honest and even-handed and just and fair. For example, if you look at Daniel, when Daniel was in the government, he was appointed there by uh, Darius, then, and people sought to condemn him. They went after him, but they couldn't find anything on him. They could not, he had not broken any law he obeyed all the laws. There, were, he, there was no way that they could, there was nothing they could say about him that would get him in trouble with the king. And the king loved him for that because he did exactly what the king commanded him to do. So we should avoid, if you're going to be in government, you should avoid the mere appearance of evil. Don't give anybody an opportunity to condemn you for anything. So it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And, and this is not saying we need to be more adept at hiding stuff. Just don't do it. You're good, you're, if you're going to be in government, you're called to put aside everything that is, the, that is called unethical. And you need to put that all away and do things that you may not necessarily want to do, but you do it anyway. For example, Mike Pence has a rule that he doesn't meet with a woman not, in his, not with his wife or his daughter, not his wife or his daughter, without having somebody there, I'll use the term, to quote chaperone, unquote. You should have those, kind. if you're going to be in government, you should have those kind of rules. Now, this is a whole subject for another, um, another uh, video, which I'm going to put out. But what we've given you here is, is a view of three different, uh, a perspective on three different views of the term Christian nationalism. We've talked about the received view which is from the 1950s, that America is God's chosen people, and he's going to treat us like he treats the nation, like he treated the nation of Israel, and so we need to um, pay attention to that. We've seen, the, um, we've seen the Reconstructionist view, where it's up to us to take control of government and establish Christianity. And we've seen the form that Stephen Wolf has. We've seen a couple of clips from him. And then third, we saw the racialist view, which is the racist view of Christian nationalism, which is something that should be every Christian should roundly denounce. And then we should um, participating in government is something that Christians could do, and that's something that uh, that uh, you can participate in, and if you do. I've given you some recommendations for what to do. So that's it. Um, again, uh, join the pilgrimage. Check out our Gab, MeWe, or Facebook pages on Pilgrimage Through the Scripture. Go to YouTube, like our video, subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you get notified if you want to hear more about these things. So, and uh, until the next time, 
Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.